Hello and welcome to Alive and Composing, the wonderful world of Innova, with today's guest, Jim Romaine. Would you state your name for the record? <laughs> Hi, Philip. I'm Jim Romaine. Now, we should probably rename this series because you're alive and performing. Is there a degree to which you consider yourself a composer as well? Uh, I don't. Uh, primarily, my focus is on working with composers, um, and I really regard myself, at least in the classical realm, as an interpreter um, of, of their music. Um, on the jazz side of things, though, I'm also a jazz saxophonist, and you know, certainly improvisation involves composing on the fly, so, uh, so I do fulfill that, that urge from time to time. Have you ever crossed the boundary or thought about jumping off that precipice, the, the, the composer cliff, where you thought, you know, I, I know my way around my instrument, and I wonder if I could do this and, like, uh, you know, fill a program with ten minutes of my own thing. You know, a, a lot of composer performers have, have started as performers, and then they just kind of fell into putting their title on the piece as well. Right. Um, I can't say that I've, I've made that, that leap. I mean, you know, even just as part of my regular, uh, just regular practice routine, I mean, I certainly, uh, even in non-jazz context, I mean, I, I like to improvise um, every day, but, but once again, um, you know, I, I think the, the, uh, the, the time, energy, really to perfect that, uh, that skill, at least for me, um, has not been something that I've pursued. Great. Well, that still means you're every composer's best friend, because we, 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 need, <laughs> we need all the help we can get to make, make the, the stuff come to life. Okay, so after a, a long squawky day, or hopefully not squawky day, with, with your baritone saxophone, how do you spoil yourself? <laughs> how do I spoil myself? Well, you know, I, I've recently, um, and I, I hope not to your chagrin, Philip, but I've recently uh, gotten very much back into uh, listening to vinyl. So I've bought a really nice record player, and, and I, I've spent spend time searching out uh, neat albums to, to check out, jazz and, and otherwise. Um, so yeah, doing, doing, just spending time listening and uh, hanging out. Microbrew also uh, a real uh, has a real appeal to me. Uh, do you ever make your own microbrewed stuff? Funny you should ask. It's been a while, but uh, uh, when I lived out in Casper, Wyoming, I was out there. I taught at a little college out there named Casper College um, for six years, starting in 1995. Um, that job afforded me a lot of spare time, and so I, I got into uh, brewing, and um, I still recall my coffee cherry stout. It was it was stunning. It was fantastic. Would love to, to find some time to to resume. So, in terms of how you and your creative life relate to your local environment, uh, Wyoming is quite a different uh, kind of uh, habitat than than Iowa. Is that true? Do, do you consider what, whatever campus you're on to be your home, or um, does your psyche somehow relate to distant mountains or cornfields like that? Uh, interesting. I, I, I think there's, there's certainly some of, some of both at work. I mean, um, wherever I am, I am always just trying to seek out what's interesting and unique about that place, whether it's the music scene or, or, or the uh, local microbrews or whatever it might happen to be. Um, you know, every place has its own unique flavor in, in every respect. And so during the time I spent out in, in Wyoming, um, you know, I, I really embraced uh, aspects of, 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 of that state that were, um, I think, unique and special too. And I spent a fair amount of time backpacking, cross-country skiing, those kinds of things. And so, um, so I do try to connect in, in a lot of ways. And that, of course, extends to uh, the kind of uh, musical partnerships that I can forge with other uh, performers and um, especially with uh, with composers. Now you're also not just a person in yourself, you're at least 25% of the uh, Oasis Quartet. How did them, that come about and wh where's the Oasis? Where's the desert? <laughs> uh, well, how it came about, um, the um, uh, our soprano player uh, Nathan Nab and I were uh, both in school at the University of Illinois at the same time, uh, 2000 to 2002. He was finishing up his undergraduate degree and preparing to go off to Northwestern 
University in Evanston for master's and doctoral work. Uh, after that, I was uh, uh, doing my doctoral studies at Illinois, and we um, found ourselves in quartet together um, at that, that time, along with uh, with uh, uh, with with a, two of our colleagues uh, at Illinois. So, um, what uh, we we developed. Um, a musical relationship, personal relationship that um, you know that we've had since since that time, um, and you know, for me at least, um, the uh, you know the personal connections I make with with other performers and with composers, um, that's what really drives and informs what I do. I mean that that um, that's what makes uh, makes it a meaningful uh, activity. For me, so uh, Nathan and I, um, years later, uh, I guess it would have been now about 2007. So about five years ago, you know, we had ongoing discussions about trying to find an opportunity to to uh, um, work together again in a quartet setting. And I'd had similar discussions with um, a, a local colleague of mine here in the Des Moines area, uh, Dave Camwell, who teaches down at Simpson College, and. Um, Dave Camwell had uh, um, a relationship with James Bunty, who is at Cincinnati Conservatory, is a professor of saxophone there, and so essentially there's a sort of web of connections that um, that brought us us together um, as a group, and now we've been at it for um, a little better than five years. So there are sax quartets and there are string quartets. What, what's the what's the cultural difference? <laughs> well. Um, you know, string quartets come to uh, that setting with a very large and set body of repertoire. Um, and so, because they have access to Mozart string quartets, the Warshak string quartets, Beethoven string quartets, I, I mean, simply mastering the great repertoire of the past can be their entire focus. Um, but for saxophonists, um, there is, you know, it's clearly not the length of past history, nor the depth of, of historical uh, work in terms of um, composers writing for our instrument. So we find ourselves, uh, in order to, um, to have music that we want to play, and that's of, uh, you know, that connects with, with us personally, uh, that has any kind of cultural uh, meaning, we work with composers um, to create new pieces. I mean, whether, whether, whether really you're talking about saxophone in a quartet setting or talking about saxophone in a solo setting, to, to um, I think all saxophonists that I know um, really consider uh, working with composers, commissioning new works to be really integral to what we do. Um, because really, as a saxophonist, I mean, playing um, the Glazunov Concerto from 1934 um, over and over for the rest of your career really is not entirely fulfilling. So that's our story. It seems there are two kinds of performers and the, the way they relate to composers. Uh, composers often write for the performer's abilities because they know that's what they're good at and what they've done before and that's where the technical chops lie. Or composers write for performers who can't do something yet, who would like to stretch as a result of being challenged and, you know, maybe learn something more about their instrument. Which kind of performer are you? <laughs> well, I, I, I do hope that I'm both kinds. I mean, I, in the sense that um, I want composers to understand what, you know, what my strengths are um, and, it, and that, that that should inform their writing, not only my, you know, my, my performance skills, but also just you know my aesthetic interest, what what direction I am wanting to move in musically, but um, I don't hide my weaknesses uh, from them, and I I certainly um, have improved as a performer, have extended myself constantly through contact with composers because I think just out of sheer pride, if if a composer asks me if I can do something say sure absolutely and that answer is probably the same whether I can actually do it or not but because I know that I can go in the privacy of my own practice space and I can probably figure out how to do the thing that they're they're hearing in their head and I, and I think that's um, to me trying to get into the composer's mind um, to uh, understand 
what it is that that they're looking for uh, um, you know to, to to rely only on my past as a performer um, I think that limits the, the scope of what of, of their artistic output and that's exactly what I don't want to do is to limit them so um, you know in in giving as much free reign as possible to the composers that I or or uh, as a member of the Oasis Quartet that we work with um, that's you know it just it simply creates freer and better music um, and uh, improves us along the way. What's the most mind-blowing work of art or performance you've ever witnessed? Is there like a uh, a moment when either your life was changed and you said you know I, I now see a whole horizon opening before me as an artist and as a performer uh, and are there certain uh, things that you aspire to do in your own performances in that regard? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, there's, you know, so many stunning performances that, uh, that I've, you know, been fortunate to to hear, uh, to witness, but I suppose uh, one of the most memorable was, I think it was 2000 or 2001, um, hearing the Kronos String Quartet um, perform um, the Pateras Vosk uh, Quartet uh, that had been recently written for them. It was um, you know, really um, extremely moving uh, at the time, but but really stuck with me. Um, I mean, it, it was really a transcendent kind of experience for me, um, and also very inspirational from the standpoint of uh, hearing a quartet that focused. Um, virtually all of their energies on um, on creating um, new works, on having new works written for them, um, and so uh, particularly in the context of um, an academic setting, uh, because that was uh, during my time at Illinois. Um, you know, there is a there was a real freedom to hearing um, what they were doing. And I felt like it opened kind of a, a, a whole new horizon of, of possibility um, for me as a performer. Um, and, you know, certainly I wasn't the only one who was deeply moved by that performance. And so simply to look around and see the extent to which uh, modern music could connect on, a, on an emotional and, and visceral level with listeners, um, that was meaningful too, because uh, I think there can be a, a, a rap, you know, sort of for, for new music and, and uh, um, can be um, a knee-jerk reaction against, uh, um, you know, so what people might imagine to be modernism. And it's more about what they imagine it to be rather than what it maybe actually is in, in experiencing it. And thinking back to the teachers that you've had and uh, the fact that you teach the youth of today as well, uh, what pearls of wisdom would you like to share? Are, are there, you know, one, two or three little epithets or really important things that you just wish uh, you, you could convey to their inner being? To their inner being? Or, or, or uh, just, just to, you know, how to wet a read. It could be technical. <laughs> um, well, I think that um, there, there's a danger when, uh, and, and it's true in any, any pursuit, but when um, specialization becomes so um, complete that it allows for people to um, um, become too narrow uh, in their experience, too narrow in uh, um, too narrow as performers, and for example, just in, in my own case. Uh, Yes, I'm a you know a concert saxophonist, um, you know pursuing my connections with with composers, um, you know performing recitals, performing with uh, the Minnesota Orchestra. I mean all these fantastic experiences, um, but but yet uh, I love jazz and and always have, and so you know uh, I find a creative outlet and certainly professional um, opportunity in. in in not limiting myself simply to one or, or, or the other, and you know, I've I've always pursued uh, work as a doubler as well. So I deal with clarinet, deal with flute, um, and so, and, and I think um, yes, that means I can get some work, 
you know, more work when Broadway shows come through. I work in the in the uh, uh, the uh, the pit orchestra at the Des Moines Civic Center. Um, but but I think more importantly, it puts me in different kinds of situations that expose me to uh, to music that I otherwise might not have come into contact with. Uh, it exposes me to musicians that I may not have had contact with if I had only done you know one thing or the other. Or, you know, for as just one example. The fact that um, that I had studied and performed as a clarinetist alongside saxophone means that when I was in um, Casper, Wyoming, I was principal clarinet of the uh, Wyoming Symphony Orchestra for six years, um, and that contact with orchestral music and orchestral musicians is something that you know many of my saxophone friends um, don't. Uh, have on any kind of regular basis. I mean, we might be called in a few times a year to play the, uh, you know, to play the soprano saxophone on bolero or or play uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, the the uh, tenor saxophone. However, um, that that ongoing uh, connection with that side of music, um, you know, I felt like it just simply can can um, you know enrich. Uh, one's background. I mean, it certainly was true in my case, and so at least with my students, I encourage them very much to to explore opportunities and to get outside of of, of the whatever their comfort zone may happen to be. And briefly, let's uh, talk a little bit about this amazing Howl, the uh, CD on Innova that you just put together and and made sound so uh, you know uh, spiffy and full of uh, saxy energy. Uh, and uh, what, what's your what's your vision for that? Um, well, I, you know, I, I've mentioned that the the, the kinds of um, personal contacts and connections that I have with composers have been you know important to me now for for quite a while. And so, in creating this particular collection of music, um, that's really what I wanted to to highlight. So, um, you know, the the four composers represented. Um, are, are, are ones who um, either wrote the piece specifically for me um, or uh, who I developed a personal connection with. And even in, in the case of uh, Eric McIntyre, um, Secondary Impressions for baritone saxophone and piano, um, even though it had been written uh, a few years ago for baritone saxophone, it's named Aaron Lington, um, because Eric teaches here in Iowa, he's at uh, Grinnell, um, and he's a, uh, he's a performer as well, he's a horn player. Uh, um, so I had some contact um, with him and became aware of his compositional activities um, and as a result of, um, of learning and recording this fantastic work, Secondary Impressions, um, uh, Oasis Quartet um, uh, commissioned a work uh, from him called Mad Scene. Um, that we're uh, going to be learning this fall and programming uh, during the upcoming year. So, um, so you know, again, that sort of just emphasizes how, uh, you know, it's not about calling a composer and getting them to write one piece and then having no more contact with them at all, um, but rather about this, this sort of, you know, ongoing relationship with composers that can, can really change um, the, my direction as a performer, um, and that I think can really contribute music to uh, to the repertoire um, for saxophone. And certainly that's the case also uh, with my good friend Mark Engerbretson, who wrote uh, Energy Drink One and Sax Max, um, both found on, on this recording. And he, uh, he's a saxophonist, um, as is his, his wife Susan Fancher, who, who has now I think two CDs on, on Innova. Um, and as a saxophonist, he brings a, 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 his own personal connection with the instrument, um, but uh, he is very uh, um, open to a direction that another performer might want to go with with his music. Um, so, for example, in Sax Max, which is written for a live saxophonist, and then um, Mark. Um, Besides being the composer, he also is the controller of Max MSP, which is the software that processes the live sound of the saxophonist. Um, and so it's it's interactive in a way that 
um, many uh, electroacoustic pieces are not. It's not a static um, um, relationship, but rather uh, different each time it's performed and different depending on the who uh, perf on who the performer might be. So my my choice with sax max was to play it on alto saxophone. Uh, Susan Fancher, who was the other uh, uh, dedicatee on the commission for sax max, uh, she performs it on soprano and. Uh, she hears that in her head, that's the voice that she wants to project into the piece, and I hear something else. And I think that, that Mark very much embraces that because uh, it really retains uh, you know, a freshness and vitality to the music each time that it's, that it's played. And where else but Innova can you get three versions of that same piece, I think. Uh, so, but we, we, we love incest around here, and uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. We wish you the very best of luck with uh, the howling. And uh, best of luck. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much, Philip.